Hello again, this is Mr. Summingo. This is another AP Bio Review video. Again, these videos are very long, but there is no shortcuts. There's no way I could shorten the videos and still give you all the information. So we're going to go very slowly. As I told you before, you know you might want to pause, break this up into pieces. Don't watch this all in one sitting because it's, it's pretty long. And also, you don't need to take notes on everything. You're going to get a copy of these notes, so things that you don't understand or if you know, if it helps you to write stuff down, you can also do that as well. But again, the point of this is to give you all the information and it gives you something to study for for the exam. So we're going to start off in this video about uh, the basics of genetics. We're going to start with how cells talk to each other, talk to each other, uh, mitosis, meiosis, and then the basics of genetics. So first, we talked at the beginning of the year about how cells talk to each other. They can do direct contact at gap junctions. So here are two, an animal cell and a plant cell, and you can see how cells talk to each other just because they're neighbors, they could communicate that way. They also can secrete stuff locally. So we talked about with neurons, we talked about neurotransmitters. And then there's also long distance, so hormones, um, it's a long process, it's a long, um, it's a long communication process. So hormones, they, you know, they, they can interact with the rest of your body just long distance. Um, next we talked about um, and then these are just examples of the last slide. Um, this one is local signaling. So here's a cell and it secretes stuff in the vesicles and it goes out to neighboring cells. Or we talked about a synapse. Here is the dendrite of another cell and the axon and it, uh, it emits these neurotransmitters to get a target cell to do something. Then long distance, we talked about it being far. Um, so say for example something from the top of your body needs to tell something to the bottom of the body and it transfers through the bloodstream through the veins and the arteries to get to a cell that's very far away. So the three stages, we talked about this being very easy, the three stages are receiving the message, um, relaying the message, and doing something once you get the message. When you get a message that's called reception. Um, when you convert the signal, when you relay the message, that's called transduction. And when you do something, that's called the response. So reception is usually between a signal molecule. It's called a ligand. So these little, like they look like teardrops. They're like the message. They're, these are called ligands. And the receptor is highly specific. So you may be saying like, what do you mean by highly specific? When we say something is highly specific, we're saying it's like a key in a lock. Well, only a specific ligand works with a specific receptor. You can't just go into any other, you can't just go into anything that you want. You can find receptors inside of a cell, so like inside the cytoplasm, inside the nucleus, they have their own receptors. Or you could find it in the plasma membrane or in the cell membrane, they also have their own receptors and they take in water-soluble ligands. The receptors, we talked about this again at the beginning of the year, there are three types of receptors and we're going to talk about all three of these processes. The first one we call it called G protein, where they have these seven transmembrane segments and it goes, you know, it passes on the message within um, the membrane. There was tyrosine kinase, and we'll talk about that one later, and also a ligand gated ion channel. So three things I want you to know, three types of ways in which you could receive a message in the plasma membrane. So G protein, if you go through these, think of this as like a story. So here is my G protein coupled receptor. Here is a G, um, what that means G protein coupled, it means it has a couple, it has a G protein pair, and it's going to work with it. So what happens is that in here in step two, the signaling molecule, the ligand, sits into the receptor. When it sits in the receptor, this G protein that used to be here all, all of a sudden goes into the receptor and gets this message. Okay? Chemically, what that means is that my, um, my GDP that was once here is now GDP. And with that GTP, it's kind of like energy. It has energy to move across to another enzyme. And what happens is that this enzyme changes shape or it moves or it does something, that GTP removes its P and it becomes GTP and it's back into its original state. So again, follow me in the story. All three of these guys are just in a normal, regular day doing nothing. The signaling molecule, the ligand comes, which means the G protein comes and gets the message and turns to GTP. The GTP moves over to an enzyme that's now activated and it does, it does something. In this case, it changes shape and the G protein goes backwards and goes back to its original process. The, third, uh, the second one, again, we're talking about three types of receptors. This one's called tyrosine kinase. So it looks like this funny little purple shape right here. And these little things are called tyrosines. Here is my ligand, and here is my binding site. And here is step one. You know, nothing's going on. They're just right here. When the ligand or the molecule sits, so it goes in and it sits, 
they, the two, um, the two, this receptor tyrosine kinase, it comes together, and now they're just one, and they call that a dimer, di, the prefix meaning two, and when they're connected, you see here that it's connected, the ATP turns into ADP, and all of a sudden they all have these phosphates attached to it, and they call, call that a phosphorylated dimer. Because the phosphates are attached, the cell then responds. These, re these relay proteins now come over to this tyrosine kinase and they do something. So long story short, ligands sit in a spot which makes these things come together. When they come together, ATP drops off its phosphates and now it's phosphorylated. And now that it's phosphorylated, these relay proteins which are inactive, not doing anything, now come over to the um, proteins and actually do something. So that's the, um, that's the second type of receptor. And the third one, which I think is the easiest one, you have a gate that's closed. When the ligand comes in, it pushes or forces the, uh, the ion channel to open, which means the ions can rush in, and these ions force the cell to do something. And that's called a ligand-gated ion channel. All right. Remember step three, we talked about trans, or step two, we talked about transduction. So the last three things they taught you is what happens when you receive it. This is called transduction. So this is relaying that message. The relay of that message is called cascades. You may have heard of cascading before. So basically, the molecule interacts with another molecule, which is another molecule. It's kind of like dominoes. There's something called a protein kinase, and that's an enzyme that phosphorylates, which means gets a phosphate, and activates another protein. And that is called a phosphorylation cascade, where you're enhancing and amplifying the signal and passing it on like a fancy game of telephone. So, that is, it's hard to see, it's a small picture, but here's an example of that transduction. So we talked about how it receives them, receives a message, which activates this, which activates this, which activates this one, which activates this one. Again, it's like dominoes. It's like it activates something, which activates another thing, which activates another thing, and eventually it goes into the cell to do the response. We also have something called second messenger. So again, we talked about how we relay the message. So one thing you could have is a second messenger. So we talked about, in a couple slides before, we talked about a G-protein coupled receptor, which makes the G-protein move and go towards another enzyme. So what happens in the second messenger is you have these small non-protein molecules that can relay. Um, the most famous one, the one that you need to know is CAMP, cyclic AMP. So when it goes into this particular enzyme, the second messenger, the CAMP, gets the message, goes to a protein kinase, and then it goes to the, does the cellular responses. Another possible second messenger is called uh, calcium. The G protein goes into uh, calcium, which changes the message into this, which changes the message to this, which goes here, which goes to the, um, which goes to another channel, and this is just another way you can get more um, you can get more cellular responses, and that's how you do transduction. And the last thing we talked about was the response, um, and then the cell does something. So once you get the message, you got to do something about it. So what it does is that it turns on or turns off genes in the nucleus, and that's what basically we're talking about making it do something. So in the beginning we talked about reception. Just these last two slides we talked about transduction. When we talked about the response, this message goes to the nucleus, and maybe there's a part of the gene or there's a part in the DNA that they want to change. Like maybe I want, hey, turn this on or hey, turn this off. So that's how the message gets passed. Once I go through transduction, it goes to this transcription factor this transcription factor goes into the DNA and makes a new mRNA, basically makes new instructions for the cell to do something different. And that's how cells signal. We talked about a long time ago, we also talked about apoptosis, which is cell suicide, in which the cell, one of the signals that a cell can get is like, hey, um, yeah, we don't need you, it's time to kill yourself. So what happens is that the cell is dismantled and it digests itself. So once it gets the signals, like they get a cascade of suicide proteins, called caspase. Um, it protects the neighboring cells from damage, so it makes sure that nobody else gets hurt, and then it kills itself. You may be wondering, you know, why would a cell kill itself? Like, why would it, why doesn't it just live? Well, it could be, and this is a case of a, uh, I don't know what organism this is, but think of a, an animal, and, you know, it's going to make fingers, so to speak. So if you think about your hands, you know, when you, when you're, when you develop, you don't develop hands like immediately. Sometimes you get this, what they call like a, like a paddle almost. 
And then the cells in between your um, fingers, they, they do cell suicide, and then all of a sudden you have fingers. Well, that's what we're trying to show you in these pictures right here. All right, so close the door on cell signaling. That's like one whole chapter we did together. So now we're going to go on to the cell cycle. This is very close to what we just did. So cell cycle we talk about is just the life of a cell. What's the life cycle of a cell? Um, we do this because it's how we reproduce, how we grow, etc. And that's how we go through mitosis, meiosis, and all those things. So first of all, some, some brief vocabulary. A genome, which we talked about very briefly, is all the cell's genetic info. So your DNA is like your genome. You may have heard of your the Human Genome Project, which they try to get, they try to map all of our genes in our DNA. There are two types of um, cells. One's called prokaryotes and one's called eukaryotes. This should be very familiar. A prokaryote only has one single circular chromosome and a eukaryote has more than one linear chromosome. We're eukaryotes. Eukaryotes have uh, cells that have nuclei. Humans have 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs. Most people think everything has 46 chromosomes. That's only humans. Mice have 40 and flies, fruit flies, only have 8 chromosomes. So just to let you know how chromosomes are. Before you do cell division, before you do mitosis, you have to duplicate your cells. What happens is that you duplicate your chromosomes and then you give a copy to the new cell. So a duplicated chromosome, this is the X's that you see all the time when we talk about chromosomes, that's a duplicated chromosome. One is, one is from, <coughs> one is the copy and one is, well they're both copies, but one is the original one's the copy. And they call that sister chromatids. So what that looks like is you have a chromosome it duplicates, so now it looks kind of like an X. And then when the cell duplicates, you have one cell with one copy and one cell with the other copy. Um, there's two different types of cells um, that you should be familiar with. We talked about it very briefly. Somatic cells, which are body cells. Are basically, pretty much all the cells in your body are somatic cells. They're diploid, which means they have two of every chromosome, and they divide by mitosis. And they call that, and they have what they call 2N, meaning we have 46 chromosomes. Gametes are sex cells. We talked about this very frequently. It's haploid, meaning it only has half or one time of each chromosome. They divide by meiosis, and for humans, N equals 23. We only have 26 chromosomes in your sex cells. The phases of the cell cycle, we talked about this. I asked you to read about this. There is a few stages. There's G1, there's S, there's G2, and then there's the M phase, or the mitotic, or the mitosis phase. Then it starts the life all over again. This is the life cycle of a cell. So 90% of the cell, um, if you're not in the M phase, they call that the interphase. So G1, S, G2, which we talked about, they call that interphase, everything that's not mitosis. G1, they like to call that the growth phase. So it grows, it carries out its normal functions. Like it's basically, G1 is like life, like you just live life. S phase usually stands for synthesis. That's when they create the new chromosomes. And then the G2 phase, kind of like the growth 2 phase, you're only growing because you're trying to prepare for cell division. So this is growing just for yourself, like you're just growing. S, you make the copies of your chromosomes, and G2, you're growing, getting bigger because you're going about to divide your cell. And then the M phase we talked about is mitosis, and that's when the nucleus divides, and also um, cytokinesis, which is when the cytoplasm divides and it like literally like splits. Uh, we talked about the steps and the phases before. We had a quiz on this very recently. You've got prophase. Some of you are confused about prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Prophase, we talk about how, um, well, let me talk about prophase and prometaphase because it's confusing to some of you. Um, the chromatin, they basically your genetic material is kind of like fluidy. It's kind of like not X's yet, so they condense and they coil and become those X's. The nucleoli, which is like the, nucleo the nucleus of the nucleus, it disappears. The spindle comes up, and then the centrosomes, remember these are the anchors on the sides, they move to the opposite end. And then in prometaphase, again, it's a little bit more specific. I'm pretty sure in regular bio or honors bio, you just combine these as prophase. But in prometaphase, the nuclear envelope or the nuclear membrane disappears. The microtubules invade the nucleus, and then the kinetochores, which are... Um, which are like, if you think of the X's as a, um, as like people, it's like the belt. So like the spindle fibers connect to the belts of all the X's. So um, here's prophase we just talked about. 
what was once like this mess right here condenses and coils into chromosomes and these centrosomes are now these anchors and the spindle forms and they're about to go to the end. In prometaphase, all that happens is that the anchors are at the side and again, these spindles are going to the kinetochores or the belts of all these X's. After prometaphase, there's metaphase, the very fancy word for like lining down the middle. All the chromosomes go down the middle. You can see this in, under a microscope, like all the chromosomes down the middle and it looks like this. In metaphase, they line up in the middle and the centrioles or the centrosomes are at the ends. Anaphase, which is the shortest phase, all it means is that they pop, like those X's are now separating. So if I look at this picture here, in, in metaphase, they're, they're here all in the middle, meta, middle phase. In anaphase, those chromosomes, those sister chromatids now like detach and they pop off. Telophase, we talked about how the nuclear membrane reforms. The chromosomes uncondensed, they used to be tightened and coiled, but now they're gonna like spread out and not be X's anymore. And in cytokinesis is when this cleavage and this little piece right here, they pop and they become two separate cells. That's cytokinesis. Animal cells, they have like a cleavage furrow, which we talk about, but plant cells, since they have a cell wall, it's a little bit different. What happens is that here, I'll show you two different um, cytokinesis. In an animal cell, you see how this cleaves in? Kind of looks like a butt, I guess you could say. Um, it kind of like goes into itself and folds and breaks apart. So you can see this in this diagram here. But in a plant cell, they don't have, they have cell walls. So what happens is that in the middle of the two cells, a cell plate forms, then it becomes one complete plate, and then it kind of connects, and now you have a new cell wall, and then you have the two daughter cells. And again, in the plant cells, they tend to be like really smushed up against each other, so they don't really pop off like they do in an animal cell. They just make a new wall or like a new fence between um, two neighbors. Um, in anaphase, what happens during anaphase is the chromosomes are walked to the poles. So these, mo these motor proteins kind of move them to the two poles. And the kinetochore, these microtubules, they get a little bit shorter. If you're prokaryotic or you're a bacteria cell or you do essentially like cloning, you do something called binary fission. Um, what happens is that this organism, this one is an E. coli cell, instead of doing the chromosome thing, it doesn't make X's. It has one long circular chromosome. It makes another copy and it finishes copying in this stage right here. Once it finishes replicating, the cleavage also occurs here and I have two daughter cells. So it's not very exciting. It's not, it's not as intense as mitosis, but you just need to know fission is when a uh, prokaryotic cell divides. And more often than not, these prokaryotic cells, like this is an actual living organism, so it's like now it's two living things. Whereas our body, like our nails or our hair, we do mitosis all the time, but when I make a new hair, it's not a new human. Whereas in prokaryotic cells, I'm making a new bacteria. When you go through the cell cycle, you can't just move on to the next step without making sure that you're really finished with that stage. So we have something called checkpoints. There are three checkpoints that basically say that you're allowed to move on to the next stage. We have a G1 checkpoint, we have a G2 checkpoint, and we have an M checkpoint. Um, the G1 checkpoint, which is the most important, basically it checks is, did the cell grow completely? Is it right? Is it okay for it to start um, division, cell division? So G1, which is the most important, tells go means go through the whole cell cycle, or it tells it to stop, like, hey, you don't need to divide, so you're just going to G0, which means you're not going to divide at all. So for example, nerve and muscle cells, you, they stay at G0. And liver cells, they, they're called back from G0. So I'm not, don't take my word for this, but I've heard about this before. They say our eyes, um, so if I look at Landon's eyes, here's my example. They say that our eyes don't really grow. Like they just kind of stay the same. So like even though his eyes may look very big, um, when he gets bigger, when he becomes an adult, like the eyes kind of stay the same. Meaning like, you know, you don't need your eyes to grow and, and things like that. Same thing with your nerves and your muscle cells. So it goes into G0 saying like you still can live or whatever, but you're not going to divide, you're not gonna grow. The G2 checkpoint basically says, are you ready for mitosis? So you did the synthesis, did you get, did you duplicate all your DNA? Did you duplicate as your stuff ready for mitosis? Cause we're gonna do this right now. And then the M phase checkpoint is after mitosis, once you're done with mitosis, it tells the cell, are you ready for cytokinesis? 
So anaphase does not begin unless the chromatids are properly attached to the spindle. So remember I talked about being connected to the belt? Like if you're not connected to the belt, if, not, if everyone's not ready to pop off and separate, then we're not going to go to this, and that's the third checkpoint. So this is just another fancy diagram of how the checkpoint looks like. So G1 is the cell goes through life. If it's, again, if it's ready to divide, if it's the type of cell that's going to divide, the checkpoint's going to say, all right, go through, um, desynthesis, do the S phase. Or if it's not a growing cell or it's not ready, it goes through G0, which is a non-growing, um, uh, non-dividing state for a cell. Now, this is a piece that you were supposed to read on your own, but I don't know if you get it. So if some of you are saying, like, how, do a check, how, does a checkpoint, how does a checkpoint work? It's not, like a, it's not like Disneyland where there's a gate and the cells go through the gate and it says, all right, pass through, like, you can go. Like, how does the body, your body, have these checkpoints? Well, the body's very smart, and it does something with what they call kinases, cyclins, and MPF. So let's look at right here in the bottom right corner what this looks like. So what it is, uh, there are these enzymes that if they're connected, it means go through. And if they're not connected, then you don't go through. So look at this, this cyclin-dependent kinase, CDK. Cyclin-dependent meaning it needs cyclin. So it's an enzyme that helps the cell cycle process, but it's not going to work unless it gets this purple thing called cyclin. So through G1, through S, through, G, um, through G2, the CDK is just by itself. It doesn't do anything. If it passes the checkpoint, if it's ready for mitosis, then the cyclin will attach to the CDK. This combined unit of CDK and cyclin is called MPF, maturation promoting factor. It's written right here. So if I have MPFs, MPF is basically um, one of the things that you need for you to go through mitosis. Once mitosis is over, like, I don't need this anymore, so this, these break apart. The cyclin breaks apart. The CDK is by itself again. And that's how the checkpoints kind of work. And that's how your body regulates mitosis. As I was telling some of you before, cancer, which is the most serious of um, diseases that affects a lot of us, cancer, you talk about um, the definition of cancer, you talk about cells that cannot stop growing or your body can't control it from dividing and growing and growing and growing, um, like a tumor. So if I don't have these CDKs or these MPFs, if this doesn't work, the cell just grows without any stopping. And that's what cancer is actually essentially doing. This picture right here is a graph of what MPF is doing during the cell cycle. So during M, you see how my MPF is super high. And then when mitosis is over, MPF, there's no MPF at all. And then when mitosis is going on, MPF is back to high. It can also be regulated, your cells can also be regulated externally. So sometimes, so here is an example of a, a dish, and here are some cells. Um, basically, the cells can stop growing if, um, you okay? Basically, cells can stop growing if there's too, it's too dense. So this is what we call density-dependent inhibition. So say, for example, the cells are here, and they start to grow, and they grow, and they grow. And then they realize, hey, there's no more space in the, there's no more space in where we're at. Like this box that we're living in, there's no more space. So we're going to stop growing um, and that's it. Cancer cells, they don't know that they're supposed to stop. So externally, cancer cells, like I talked about tumors, they're like, okay, keep on growing, keep on growing, keep on growing. So now it grows and it rises and you get, you know, these lumps that we talk about um, because the body doesn't know it's supposed to stop growing. Like it doesn't get the signal that it's supposed to stop. So um, here are the things that we talk about. Growth factor, these are proteins that are released by other cells to stimulate cell division. So there are proteins in your body that tell other cells like, hey, start to grow. And then here, you get the message, you grow. Hey, you grow, hey, you grow. Those are called growth factors. Density dependent inhibition, as I told you, is basically when cells are too crowded, they stop dividing. And then anchorage dependence, means cells have to be attached to another cell or extracellular matrix to divide. So I skipped it in this last slide, but these cells are not gonna grow unless they're next to other cells. So not, they, basically they're, um, how can I say this? They're super dependent, like they're not gonna grow, they're not gonna do anything unless they find like a buddy or a friend next to them. It's like, okay, now I'll grow. That's called anchorage dependence. It needs to anchor to another cell to grow.
Cancer cells, again, is the sort in which cells lose the ability to control growth or I'm giving the regulation and it won't, like, it won't get the message to stop growing. Here's an example of a normal cell and here's an example of a cancer cell. So usually there's a multi-process, multi-step process of five to seven genetic changes for a cell to transform. A cancer cell, basically, remember I talked about anchorage dependency, like it needs a friend to want it to grow. It doesn't have that um, insecurity. It can grow with or without a friend. And also it doesn't have density dependency. So even if it's crowded, it's still going to grow. Tumors are masses of abnormal cells. So a benign tumor is a lump of cells that are at the original site, like they haven't outgrown its site. And they usually say that as it's a good thing because it's benign, meaning it's not spreading. It's not spreading and not going anywhere. So benign is good, but you still have a cancer. Ow! Malignant is invasive, meaning it impairs the functions of one or plus organs. And that's what they officially call cancer if you have a, a lump or something and it's impairing something in your body. Metastasis is when the cells separate from the tumor and they travel to other parts of the body. So here's a four step process talking about the cancer. Here's an example of a tumor growing. Tumor meaning it's growing and growing and growing and it's not supposed to. So what's happening is that it starts to invade other cells. If it's starting to invade other cells, then we're calling it cancer. These cancer cells spread through the lymph and the, through the blood vessels and other parts of the body, metastasis. And then this cancer cells, they survive and establish a new tumor in another part of the body. And that's not, really, and that's not good at all. Um, so moving on to the next topic, um, we'll go through some of this very quickly because I think it's much easier than everything I taught before. There's type of reproduction, there's asexual and sexual. You should know that asexual is just one organism reproducing itself, it produces a clone. And sexual is what you know for humans is that you need two parents, a male and a female, and causes a lot of diversity. It's not like asexual where you get a clone. Things that do asexual, we're talking about budding and binary fission, so bacteria, sponges, some organisms, they do asexual reproduction, and obviously we do, and trees do sexual reproduction. So for example, a hydra, um, this is an example of a, of a small organism, and this is the parent, and when it's ready to reproduce, a part of it kind of buds off the body, and it makes an exact clone. Whereas the redwoods or trees, they do sexual reproduction. He talked about in the plants video about how, how plants reproduce, how they need a male and a female. Now, when we talk about chromosomes, um, this is the way that we send our genetic code to, um, to our offspring. So remember a somatic cell we talked about as a body cell or any cell in your body that's not a sex cell. Each one has what they call homologous chromosomes, one from your mom and one from your dad. The autosomes, so remember there's 23 pairs of chromosomes, 22 of them are called the autosomes. They're the chromosomes that are not the sex chromosomes. And then the last pair of chromosomes, they call it the sex chromosomes, you either have XX if you're female or XY if you're male. Um, the gametes, again, which are your sperm and eggs, they have 22 autosomes and only one of the sex chromosomes. So it's either if you're an egg, you're 22 chromosomes and you have an X, or if you're sperm, you have either 22 autosomes and an X or 22 and a Y. So when we talked about, when we talked about it in class, we talked about how, you know, how to determine if you have a boy or a girl is really depending on the male. The, the female always has 22 autosomes and an X chromosome. It's the guy, it's the dude that has either X or Y that determines if your kid is going to be a boy or a girl. So in a somatic cell, these are homologous chromosomes. So this one, it's duplicated, but see, it's kind of similar to this one. That's why we call that homologous, or these ones right here. In this particular diagram, red is maternal for mom and blue is for dad. So even though these are different chromosomes, they're kind of the same, they code for the same stuff because um, one's from the mom and one's for the dad. Now, a karyotype, um, which is this picture right here, is a complete picture of all your chromosomes. And it's arranged from largest to smallest. So here's one, the first pair of chromosomes, the second pair of chromosomes, three, four, five. You can see the numbers, like, even though they're kind of small. And then all the way up to 22. And the last one, you either have XX or XY. In this particular one, you have XY. So they're pretty colorful. These colors are coded for different genes. And again, you can see which ones are homologous chromosomes because they're the same length. Um, so in the life cycle, not that you need to know, I'm going to skip over that slide. 
you should know that we go through mitosis our whole lives, our body, when we grow, we do mitosis. When we're ready to have offspring or when we create sperm and eggs, we go through meiosis and when they merge, they fertilize and we start the process all over again. That's a little bit different, which I talked about in the plant video with um, plants, how we talk about alternation of generations. And then most fungi, um, they spend a lot of their times in um, in this N, in this haploid format because they're actual um, organisms too. So that's what they do differently. So humans, I'm not going to go over humans that much. You should know it already. Um, there's some slides talking about how animals, how humans go through that process. Plants, we talked about in the last video, is called alternation of generations. What do you mean by alternation of generations? Like when you switch to haploid, these haploid cells actually are living organisms. So like I was telling you in the other video, when we create sperm and create egg, they're just sex cells. They don't do anything until they merge together. But for plants, if you're a gamete, if you're a sex, um, I guess it's not, it's not right to say sex cell, but if you're a gamete, like a sperm and an egg's a gamete, you actually exist as a plant as well. So that's what we say by alternation of generation. You can exist as a plant like down here, a diploid, or you can exist as a plant here as a haploid. And this is similar to what we talked about in the last video. And then fungi, protists, algae, um, they never exist as diploids. They only exist as haploids. So here's an example. It looks like a very ugly thing. It goes through life as a haploid. And it does mitosis and mitosis and mitosis to reproduce and make itself or to grow. When it's ready to fertilize, they come together and become a zygote. But then they go through meiosis and that's how you become to live as an organism again. Meiosis is a fancy word for reduction division. So in meiosis, cells divide twice to have only half of what you of what you originally had. So in the beginning, this is what you have. In meiosis one, my homologous chrome separates, and then meiosis two, those X's go back into these single things, and now you only have half of the chromosomes as what you usually have in the parent cell. So here's meiosis 1. I'm going to go through this real quick. Again, it's the same process as um, mitosis, but um, there are a few things that are different, and you'll see this in red. So everything in meiosis 1, same processes, same phases, but you see in red what's different. First of all, we have something called synapsis, which you don't have in mitosis. Synapsis is when the homologous chromosomes line up. Remember in mitosis, there were just X's down the middle. But now we have X and X and X and X down the middle, okay? And then the second thing, oh, and then this, this together is called a tetrad. Tetrad, if you ever played Tetris or Tetris, like it means four. So we have four sister chromosome, uh, chromatids together. It's okay, Landon. So here at the top, I have one, two, three, four chromatids. They call that a tetrad. And what happens, what's special about this meiosis is that things cross over. So the things from your mom and your dad, you don't, your sperm and your eggs don't have completely what your dad has or completely what your mom has. They actually mix together. They call that crossing over. So here under an electron microscope, you can see chromosomes actually crossing over and changing information. So what once was X's that were completely blue and completely red, they cross over and they kind of mix and they become blue red. Metaphase, the same thing, they go down the middle. Anaphase, they separate. And then telophase and cytokinesis are the same. Here's an example, another diagram of what happens. So in prophase one, which is over here, um, remember the hom homologous chromosomes, they line up and they cross over. And when they cross over, you see here in anaphase, you see how it's not all red and all blue anymore. They mix their information. And then they cleave and they become two cells just like in mitosis. Meiosis 2 is exactly like mitosis. So when you say meiosis 2, I'm really saying it's mitosis. So there's no interphase, there's no crossing over, the spindle forms, they go down the middle, the chromatid separates, and at the end you get four haploid cells and the nuclei reappear. And each daughter cell, like in when you do meiosis, none of the four are the same. So here's an example, of, um, or here's a diagram of meiosis 2 again. Um, in this particular case, you see uh, basically the same thing that you see in mitosis. You see the nuclear envelope disappears, 
metaphase, they line down the middle. Again, they're not completely red and completely blue. They mixed up. They separate, and at the end, you get four cells, four haploids. They call it daughter cells. Um, again, things that are different in meiosis that are not in mitosis. So first of all, there's synapses when the homologous chromosomes come together, and they cross over. In metaphase, down the middle, it's not just X's, it's pairs of X's. And then three, um, when you do anaphase, when you separate, the sister chromatids are still attached. So remember when we talked about the kinetochores, like they connect to the belt and they pop off? In this particular case, the X's just separate. There's no popping, there's no separation in anaphase. One common question they, ask, they like to ask in bio, AP bio exams is, where is genetic variation? Or how come all of our kids aren't exactly the same? Where do we get variation from? So there are a couple of answers that you need to know for that case or for that specific, specific AP bio question. First of all, there's crossing over. When you cross over, you never get the same um, daughter cells. They're all different, okay? So number one, we get variation in crossing over. Two, we get variation because of the independent assortment of chromosomes. So when you have a homologous pair, when they line up and they separate, it could be anywhere. It could be blue, blue, red, red, like this one, or it can be blue, red, blue, red. Like it's not all the dads go to the left and all the mom chromosomes go to the right. They can, they can assort themselves, sort themselves independently. And just based on, say if you start with this, these are the types you're gonna get at the end. Whereas if you start off with this, you can look like this at the end. So when you say independent assortments, we're saying the chromosomes could line up. It doesn't have to be all dads and all moms. They could also mix up as well. And then lastly, random fertilization. So again, the three sources of genetic variation crossing over. The chromosomes, when they line up for metaphase, they're different. And then random fertilization. So every sperm and every egg is different. You have 8 million, for example, 8 million types of sperm and 8 million types of eggs that you that you produce, which means there's 64 trillion combinations um, that you could have, even though it's the same mom and the same dad that are um, creating offspring. So that is the difference between mitosis and meiosis. I'll go, I don't want to go through this because we've said it a lot, but just know you should know what mitosis is, what meiosis is, and what the difference is between the two. All right, so we close the door on that chapter. If you need a break, take a break. If you haven't taken one already, if you've taken multiple breaks, that's okay. But we're moving on to um, the principles of genetics. So this is where we kind of finish off genetics, okay? We learned about a guy named Mendel. Mendel was considered like one of the fathers of genetics. Um, first of all, they say that um, his principles are, there's four of them, there is an alternate version of genes and they're called alleles. Second is that every organism inherits one allele from each parent. If two alleles are different, the dominant allele, or they call it the dominant gene, is expressed. If they are both considered, uh, and the one that has no noticeable, no noticeable effect is called recessive. So for example, like I have dark eyes, and Landon has dark eyes, but maybe we have an allele or a gene for blue eyes. We just don't express it. And then the law of segregation, the last of Mendel's principles, is that there's two alleles for each character separate during gamete um, formation. And we'll talk about how that, what I mean by that. So for example, um, in Mendel's experiments, he used um, peas or pea plants, but this is an example with flowers. So say for example, I crossed a purple flower and a white flower, and they had kids, and what happened was that all their kids were purple. So it's like, you know, you don't get pink, you don't get half purple, half white babies, you get purple. And then when I self-pollinate them or I cross-pollinate like all these babies, like I had them pollinate and fertilize each other, what happened was is that some of them were purple and some of them were white. And some people say like, man, that's really weird because all the parents were purple, why would they have kids that are white? So what that tells me is that there has to be some sort of allele that is dominant and recessive that you don't really see, you just see what's being expressed. So the P generation, they call that for parents, the F and the F2 talking about the, the kids. So when we talk about alleles, some people always get confused for alleles. So say for example, you have two homologous, uh, two chromosomes, one from your dad, the blue, and one from your mom, which is red. Let's just say your dad and your mom have the same gene, so for your dad's gene codes for purple, and your mom's gene codes for white. 
So that's what they call alleles. They're the same gene, but they're different versions of it. So I remember Mendel, he was the one that discovered dominant and recessive genes based on his own experiments with pea plants. So for example, when he did flower color, there was purple and white, or seed color, yellow and green. He noticed that this ratio was very similar. It was like almost always three to one. Um, like for example, for every three yellow peas, there was one green pea. And every time he cross-mated, he always had this three to one ratio. So that's when we started doing these, uh, these Punnett squares and why these Punnett squares came to be um, accepted as an acceptable way of determining um, genetically what the offspring will have. So this is what we mean by having um, dominant. Remember we talked about capital letters and recessive lowercase letters. So for example, purple flowers have capital P, capital P, and white flowers have lowercase, lowercase p. Um, even though its kids would have a purple appearance, it's, um, it's actual what they call a, um, the genotype, like what these genes are, is capital P and lowercase p, meaning that they have the genes for white even though they don't express white. And then if they cross-breeded, cross-bred this generation, they noticed that, you know, when I do the Punnett square, there's one out of four chance that you'll get lowercase, lowercase p, which explains in those meticulous experiments that Mendel did why the ratio is always three to one. And that's called the law of segregation. So when you're talking about dominant, we're talking about capital and recessive, we usually use lowercase. Um, the vocabulary words that we used, so remember we talked about phenotype and genotype. Phenotype is what's the physically expressed um, trait and genotype is what's the uppercase lowercase um, code that they have so in this case is you see four flowers three look exactly the same and one is you know one is white their phenotypes are purple purple and purple and white but genotype we're talking about capital B capital P which is homozygous dominant then we have heterozygous where their capital P lowercase p even though the phenotype is the same and then we have lowercase lowercase p which is homozygous recessive so homo meaning same and hetero meaning different. Phenotype is what's physically expressed and genotype is the genetic makeup. So we also figured out, you know, how do you determine if the dominant trait is homozygous or heterozygous? Like how do you know, for example, if this is capital P, capital P, or if this is capital P, lowercase p? Like how do you determine if it's homozygous or heterozygous? Like how do you know? You can't just cut up a flower and see like, capital and lowercase p's. So what they do to figure out what this is, is they cross, uh, they do a test cross and they cross it with a recessive phenotype. They know this is white, it has to be lowercase, lowercase p. So if they cross these two, and if this flower happens to be capital P, capital P, all the offspring will be purple. But if this is capital, um, capital P, lowercase p, if this is heterozygous and I cross with this, I should have half and half. So that's how you can, this is the technique in which you could figure out what kind of flower or not even a flower, just any organism, and determine if it's a dominant homozygous or if it's heterozygous. Cross it with a recessive, a double recessive. Another law is the law of independent assortment. Um, basically, this says that each pair of alleles separates independently during gamete formation. So essentially, um, for example, color and shape for these peas, they don't go together. Like color and shape aren't together. They're independent, hence independent assortment. So that's why you see in these, um, if you notice that I have these Punnett squares, but instead of just um, two letters, now I have four. Um, this is an example of independent assortment, meaning that you could have a variation of one of the two, color and shape, but they don't affect each other. They're independently assorted. Um, another thing that you should know is monohybrid and dihybrid cross. Uh, monohybrid is when you cross just one thing, like I showed you. Um, like flower color, and then dihybrid, which you saw in the previous slide, we're talking about um, doing two things at the same time, like flower color, flower, flower color, and seed shape. So, um, the laws of probability. So, when you do, you've done probability before, this helps determine, you know, the Mendelian inheritance. Um, so, for example, let's do some basic probability questions. So, say for example, you're rolling dice, and you say, what's the probability of two, throwing two sixes? Well if I roll one die, the chance is one out of six, you're gonna roll a six. If I roll the other die, it's one out of six also. So to determine the probability, what you do is you multiply the two of them. One six times one six is 136. Um, same thing as saying, what's the probability of having five boys in a row? The probability of having a boy is one in two. So having a one in two chance and then multiplying it by itself five times gives me a one in 32 chance that you have, you're gonna have five boys in a row. 
And if I did a cross, if I made up a, a cross right here, and what's the probability I'd get this? Well, you notice that um, for A's, I'd have a half chance of getting capital A lowercase a. For the B's, um, I have a half chance also, and the C's, I have a one-fourth chance. So ultimately, I have a one in 16 chance of getting that cross. That's called the rule of multiplication. Um, probably that two independent results will occur together. That's different than the rule of addition. The rule of addition, we're talking about two mutually exclusive events and add together those probabilities. So what's the chances that you throw a die, you throw a dice, and you're gonna get a four or a five? Well, the chance of getting a four is one in six. The chance of landing a five is one in six. So I add those and get one third. So hopefully you guys understand when you multiply and when you add. This one is kind of like an or, and this one in the multiplication one, it's kind of like an and. So rule of multiplication, rule of thumb is that you use and and use or for addition. Uh, I'm going to skip over these um, tables. We're going to go over them in the next slides. Um, there's also things that are genetic. We also talk about blood typing. You should know that there's different types of blood, uh, different types of blood or blood groups. There's type A, type B, type AB, type O. Um, you should know that O is the universal donor. Like if you have blood, blood type O, everybody loves you because anyone can take your blood. Um, and they call. Um, and they say you're, you're selfish, but you're lucky if you have type AB because you can take anybody's blood. So type O is good because you can give your blood to everybody. Type AB is good because you can take anybody's blood. Um, this is what the genotypes look like, and I'll help explain what it looks like on the next slide. So this is what I was telling you about in terms of blood transfusions, like who can take what. Uh, when you do a blood transfusion, you have to match the blood type. Um, I don't know if you've heard about this before, but there's not only a blood group, but there's also positive and negative. So like, for example, my blood type is B positive. So like, this is where, this is my blood type. Um, what happens is that if you don't get the right blood, if you have the wrong type transfused into the wrong, you know, the, the wrong type into the wrong person, um, the mixing of fluorine blood causes it to clump. And then if your blood clumps, then that equals death. So you do not want a mixing of the wrong blood. The pluses and the minuses, they're called the, the RH factor, and it's a protein that's found on the red blood cells. So if it has the protein, they call that positive, and if it doesn't have the protein, they call that negative. When you talk about your physical appearance, your phenotype, um, it's not only genetic, but it's also environmental. So for example, these are hydrangea flowers, and their shade and how the intensity of their color depends not only on their parents, but also the acid and the aluminum content of the soil. So these ones, even though these are red and blue or pink and blue, um, they could be even stronger blue. They could be fainter pink, depending on how acid, how much aluminum is in the soil. So not, phenotype is not only genetic. In terms of figuring out like how in humans, how the inheritance looks like, they do something called pedigrees. Um, they do this by putting a man in squares and girls in circles. And if a trait is expressed, they have like a different color. So this is, you don't need to know much about a pedigree other than you might see a question with a pedigree and just know that this is how they determine like how things, how traits are passed down in the family. One thing you could do to figure out about genetics is you could do testing. And you may be wondering, like, why would you want to find out the genome or the genetics of your child? Um, the main reason why is because they want to know if there's going to be a genetic disorder beforehand. And some of you saying, you know, it sounds risky. Um, I'd say the majority, if not all, pregnancies now do some sort of genetic testing to make sure that there's no disorders when the baby is born. Uh, there's two ways that you can do genetic testing. There's amniocentesis, where they remove the amniotic fluid. So if this is the baby, they take some of the amniotic fluid and they check it out for its karyotype. They also do something called chorionic villus sampling. And what they do is they insert a narrow tube in the cervix and they extract some sample of the placenta. So here is amniocentesis. Again, they take a needle and they take some of the fluid. Or they could do chorionic villus sampling where they put the suction tube in here. And I know it's disgusting, but that's how they do that way of genetic testing. Um, some of the disorders that they test for and some of the things that we know of that we don't want, uh, cystic fibrosis, Tay-Sachs disease, sickle cell disease, um, PKU, which I don't know too much about, and then Huntington disease. And we'll talk about how these are bad. Um, autosomal recessive, what this means is that if you have, it's a genetic disorder where you have a double recessive, um, for, so for example, cystic fibrosis is a, is a disorder that only affects if you have the double recessive. Some of us have the 
gene for cystic fibrosis, but since it's recessive, we don't express it. So on the off chance that the child has a double recessive in cystic fibrosis, then they'll express it. Um, and this is one of the few disorders, Huntington's disease, where it's, if you have double dominant, then it's very bad, and that's the Huntington's disease. So the theory of inheritance is that the genes on a chromosome, remember these are chromosomes, or they kind of look like X's um, when they're doubled, is they have specific locations called loci, they're on the chromosomes, and they have what they call genes, and how those genes segregate and they assort independently. Some of the genes are also what they call sex-linked. So we're talking about genes that are, remember we talked about chromosomes that are sex, X and Y. This is what an X chromosome looks like. This is what a Y chromosome looks like. And basically some of the disorders or some of the things that are passed down only travel on the X chromosome or only travel on the Y chromosome. For example, fathers, they pass their X-linked genes to their daughters, but not their sons. Or males, they express their recessive trait on like a single X. Um, so these are called sex-linked genes. Um, and females, they can be affected or they could be the carrier. Um, this is an example of what we're talking about, how things can be passed down. It gets a little complicated, kind of confusing to explain over a video. But let's just say again, um, we have X and X and X and XY. So we're being a little bit more specific for male and female. But they now have a little, a capital letter or a lowercase letter attached to it depending on the X chromosome. Remember the Y? Um, doesn't matter so much so you see the y's you don't see the you don't see a n or a, a superscript here but it all depends on the x's and depending on what that ha what happens with those x's determines how the kid um, what their potential for having a disorder is what are these sex linked disorders you may ask it could be color blindness so they say males are more likely to be colorblind than, um, than women um, muscular dystrophy or hemophilia um, so here's another thing that um, another disorder you could say. Um, a bar body, which is when you have an inactive X chromosome. So it regulates the gene dosage in females during embryonic development. So for cats, so say for example a cat, um, the allele for fur is on the X chromosome. So basically since it's only on the X chromosome um, and the, to have a double X, only female cats can be uh, basically a tortoise shell or a Coleco. So for example here are the X chromosomes and one has an allele for orange and one has an allele for black. And then during cell division and all that stuff, the X is inactive. So these right here, as you can see here, the orange and the black, they're inactive. So the active X really determines if it's going to be orange or black fur. Um, so that's a special case where you have an ac uh, X chromosome that's inactive. Um, in terms of human development, or specifically talking about humans, the Y chromosome is required for the development of testes. Um, the embryo gonads are indifferent at two months, so in, at two months um, you can't determine if your fetus is a boy or a girl. They're exactly the same. But the SRY gene, this is um, a picture of it, um, helps determine whether the, what the gender of the baby is going to be. And then this G is on the Y because it's only found on the Y chromosome. So this is the XRY, SRY gene. And it codes for a protein that regulates all the other genes to determine what gender you are. Um, Another vocab word you need to know is genetic, uh, genetic recombination. So it's the production of offspring with a new combo of genes from parents. So if the offspring look like the parents, they call that parental types. And if they're different, they call that recombinants. So for example, um, these are gametes from a green wrinkled or um, homozygous recessive parent. And these are gametes from a yellow round dihybrid parent. So these are called the parental types because they look like the parents and these do not look like the parents and they call that recombinants. If the results do not follow um, these, the law of independent assortment, then the genes are probably linked. So remember, in independent assortment, like color and shape, they sh they're two separate things, that, and they never do anything together. But if they don't, um, if they don't follow the rule, Mendel's law, then the genes are linked together. So they're saying, like for example, if you look at this fly, it looks kind of disgusting looking at these flies. But if we test cross and do these things, they notice that um, that some of these, I don't want to explain the whole thing, but let's just say some of the things are actually um, grouped together. So for example, like a gray body and normal wings tend to be um, linked together. Like there's no gray body and short wings. You never really see that. You usually always see either black vestigial wings or gray normal wings. Um, you notice in these ones, there's barely any in the results. There's very rarely do you see a gray, 
a gray fly with short wings or a black man this looks really ugly but a, a black fly with large wings so these are what they call linked genes um, they're located on the same chromosome and they tend to be inherited together during cell division uh, remember talking about crossing over so this explains why linked genes get separated during meiosis so remember in meiosis so here's my two chromosomes and then they cross over so now this is peach and now this is red and then when they cross um, when they make the eggs or when they make the gametes um, if they're close together they tend to be going together so say for example look at this peach part right here it used to be here and now it crossed over but what I'm saying is that so anyway, because of the crossing over, because it works like this, things that are close together, they tend to be linked. So the further apart they are, the higher probability of crossing over, and the higher recombination frequency. Um, this is the way that you can calculate recombination frequency. I can explain it over video, but I'll, I'll do it over in person because I, I don't like doing math over video, so I'll explain this later. And then they have something called a linkage map. Um, this is a genetic map that uh, essentially is based on the percentage of crossover events so here are some examples of genes like a B, C, N, and B, G and just based upon um, their recombination frequency they can kind of map out where the genes are. 50% um, recombination means they're far apart on the same chromosome or on two different chromosomes. Um, some of the things that can go wrong in terms of chromosomes and inheritance I'm going to talk about some of the problems that can occur. One's called non-disjunction so in this particular case, you'll notice that, remember in meiosis 1, the homologous chromosome is supposed to separate. Um, well, if they don't separate and they go over, um, you, have a, you have a situation where the gametes can have, either have too many or too little chromosomes. And that's called non-disjunction. Um, this can also happen in meiosis 2. You notice here in meiosis 2, um, remember they're supposed to pop and separate. These did not pop and separate. So now you also have a situation where they have either too much or too little chromosomes. Um, if you have uh, the incorrect number of chromosomes, they call that aneuploidy, where you have one copy or three copies, monosomy or trisomy. Uh, polyploidy means you have two plus complete sets of chromosomes, 3N or 4N. Um, it's rare in animals, but it's pretty frequent in plants. This is a tetraploid mammal. Um, species think that this species may have arisen when an ancestor doubled its chromosome number um, by errors in mitosis and meiosis. So this is kind of an example of like the things that can go wrong and how it can um, develop into future offspring. There's also mutations that can occur, um, a deletion. So for example, you're supposed to have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, like letters. But when you do the chromosome, when it goes into a chromosome, it's missing D. That's called a deletion. Or there could be duplication where a segment is repeated. When you do the DNA duplication or DNA replication, um, basically the part gets duplicated. You could have inversion. So when it copies, instead of saying B, C, D, it says D, C, B. Or translocation where everything is correct, but it's in the wrong location. Um, there are some exceptions to the Mendelian laws. One's called genomic imprinting. Um, this is an effect of a gene where it depends from a male or female parent. Um, and silence genes by adding methyl groups to DNA. Um, maybe this stuff I'll explain in class. Um, so some of the genes that are located in organelles don't go by Mendel's laws either. So mitochondria, chloroplast, plastids, they all have their own genes as well. Um, and they also contain some small circular DNA. So the Mendel stuff does not, the Punnett squares don't apply. Um, also, mitochondria, they have maternal inheritance, where it's from the eggs or the female part only, so then that doesn't apply as well. So I, I know it was a very super long video. hope you understand everything. Again, if you master all this, if you understand this, if you rewatch this, if you've been pausing and rewinding and rewatching, I think you'll do very well in the AP exam. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you all later.